Hey guys, welcome to another reoccurring episode on TAT the podcast. This is going to be our Q&A. It's going to be popping up here and there. We've had some people throw in some questions and we're going to be answering them one by one. Tristan, what is your opinion on riding with spurs? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, you mean these big daddies. <laughs> the, um, we use them for cutting pizzas here in this man cave. Some people call them pizza cutters uh, in the Western game. This is actually a pair of spurs that I um, used in my rookie debut, actually back in Nanagoon. I got to ride a horse uh, from a good friend at that time, Jade, with a mate that was training, reining horses around the corner, Eight Mile Ranch, Paul Beath. Paul was the guy from the first podcast that I was with, uh, with the fires. <clears throat> yeah, and of course, this is the, the, the culture. This is the dress code, just like we have a dress code in uh, dressage where, yeah, it is compulsory or obligatory to wear gloves and also spurs. I used to think that spurs were a refinement of something, um, that you can touch the horse lighter or softer. And actually, it sort of came in the last couple of years, last few years, I guess, that um, actually I was training together with Klaus Balkenhol and, and Annabelle the Balkenhol family in, uh, in Germany. And I was helping them, as I do now, helping them with their horses. And I would always take a couple of my horses and uh, Klaus or Annabelle would help me with them. And I'd worked a couple of horses in the morning for Klaus. We were doing some Piaf in hand and doing some groundwork and then I rode one of my horses in the afternoon and halfway through the lesson he said to me yeah why is it like on the ground you can be one meter away from the horse and without seeing anything you're getting a huge amount of energy on the horse and you're you're not even touching the horse you're one meter away why can't you do that when you're sitting on them? <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so I went home <laughs> and I went to the drawing board and I started to strip back that process. Like, what am I actually doing on the ground? Of course, I was for quite some time always working on trying to connect the groundwork to the writing, the relationship, the conversation, the way of interpretation from the horse. But it wasn't until he said that, that I sort of really stripped down, okay, what is the order of communication that I'm using? And is it even sufficient on the ground? And, you know, I used to think, you know, uh, body language, the voice, and then the aid, leg aid, or practical example, whatever you're doing, whatever situation, riding or groundwork. And then, you know, I always remember that quote, that the horse never gets softer than the first pressure you give. Wayne Benny told me that back in Australia when I was working for Jim and Emmy. And that stuck with me, you know, and he was the one that sort of first introduced me to being as light as possible. You know, it should become just a thought. I was also starting young horses and an old man used to come with a string of cotton and he used to put it through the halter and if he would back, it all, back the horse up and the string would break, I didn't get paid for that horse. So that was also a reminder that, you know, the horse has to understand what we're asking. And Morton also used to say to me all the time, um, you know, he would sort of touch my hand and then he would squeeze my hand and then he would say, okay, now touch my hand again, do you feel the difference? <laughs> I said, yeah, I don't feel anything after you've been squeezing my head. <laughs> and, you know, reminding me that a horse can feel a fly and all those sorts of things, the level of sensitivity. And so going on that premise and all those thoughts, you know, I was thinking all the time about what is the smallest amount of pressure? What is pressure? How can we strip that back? And then also talking to my father-in-law, now, Rob Keevers, who's um, in vision therapy, always talking about the order of how things happen. And, um, you know, I sort of, through talking to him and how we interpret things, how we receive information, how we process it, 
there was that moment where I was sort of thinking, actually, the, the furthest back I can strip, strip it back to is a sensation for me at this moment. Maybe my brain gets a little larger when I go further than that. But at the moment, it's about sensation. Sensation is the first step of communication. So sensation, and it's probably people more intelligent than me that's going, ah, oh, he's only that far. But sensation, then thought, then body language, then the voice, and then the contact. And of course, when you put things behind the first aid, you know, for many years, the first way I asked was the last one with the contact. Horse was never going to get softer than the first pressure I gave, which was the leg, in, or in some cases, the spur. You know, if you're going to go and work, walk and the first thing you do is let your horse feel the spur, then he, you know, it becomes a making, not a teaching. That was the other big philosophy for me is about teaching to them before doing to them. Are you making him do it? Are you teaching him to do it? Does your horse feel like he's in control of himself or feel like he's being controlled? So all these sort of things sort of came together and, you know, a lot of people say, well, how can you have a sensation before thought? But, of course, if I was to throw a stone at you, you first have the sensation <laughs> and then you think, hey, fucking threw a stone at me. So the sensation is coming first and so, of course, it happens very quickly when you're working with a horse. In the beginning, you have to be very conscious about thinking of it to put those, that order and that pattern of execution in place till it becomes automated. So it's that the sensation of going left, the thought of going left, the feeling of going left body language, you know, the voice backwards, forward, whatever direction you're going. And then the practical example of a guiding with the whip where not to be on the ground or the guiding of a leg to ask the horse to follow. So that just minimized everything. That also gave me the clarity between what are the steps I use when I'm on the ground? And are they the same when I ride? Well, they weren't. And that's why the horses were, I was not able to do the same thing. Like Klaus said, why can't you do what you do on the ground on the horse? And it was exactly because of that reason. Because I changed the process and the language of what I was using, the way I was asking. And on the ground, I became focused on it and I became very good at it because I had to in order to really give the horses a feeling and understanding of their own physiology. And when I was getting back in the saddle, I went partly to a technical aspect of riding, how to get a horse to do a half pass, how to you know, execute that kind of movement. And then I realized, of course, if I'm gonna go like that, I don't need you know, the next level of a soft leg and then the spur. The spur for me became a making. When I started to ride without them, then I also felt a huge difference in the physiology in my horses. I always talk about in the groundwork of tension movement and I was actually getting parts of that in my horses and I didn't realize till I took them away and I was really focusing on that sensation, thought, feeling, or body language, motion, voice, then the practical example. But the practical example got very, very minimal because I had all the steps before it. And when I wasn't using the spur, I realized that the horse's awareness of his own body through becoming in tune to those steps and also then the awareness of himself of the way he moved because I wasn't doing it for him. I wasn't taking the responsibility from him. I wasn't making him or getting him to feel uncomfortable that he had to do it. He stayed in the process of what he was doing instead of feeling like, oh, this is now making me do this or this is, you know, Maybe the process doesn't go exactly like that in their head, but the feeling I got was that the horses were much more fluent. The conversation, the order of movement was more seamless. There was less blockages, less shutdown in the body where they separated mind and physiology because of them feeling a discomfort or not being in tune or not operating with that perfect order within the body. And when I got back on and rode a day with spurs because I had a competition or, you know, I felt like the horse wasn't going quick enough across and I thought if I could make him a bit sharper or a bit more responsive or whatever, then immediately my horses were stiffer. They were also not 100% with me or feeling like they were taking responsibility or part fully of this conversation. They're not stepping into the space of conversation. I was ruling it more. 
And I just felt through their physiology, it was limited. It got more stiff. Um, and through their physiology getting more stiff and tight, then the mind was also not as exploring, wanting to be a part, wanting to participate enough. So I guess it was just a proof by experimentation, learning by doing. I was testing what was going on. I was evaluating my relationship, my conversation with my own horses, how was really the thing that I was doing on a daily basis on my horses going? What did it really look like? What did it mean? How did they feel about the conversations every day? And yeah, for me, it works. You know, for a lot of other people, it may be, you know, a piece of their gear that they could, couldn't do without. So, uh, you know, it's up to the individual and it has to be very much part of you. You can't do something because you think, oh, that, horse, that person is viewed better because he doesn't use spurs, so I should do that as well. No, I think you have to come to it in a, in a way that's personal to you. Um, what I think is really difficult is that we are obliged to wear spurs in sport, So, which I don't. Um, you know, and probably... The, um, yeah, I don't even know how that will go. I've ridden now competitions without spurs and nobody said anything. But um, I, th I think that's also difficult because in one way, you know, the people responsible for our sport or the FEI are also saying that we are creating happy athletes. We're doing the right thing for our horses. But on the other hand, the rules are set in a way that doesn't allow you to do what you personally may think is the absolute right thing for your horse. So there's a bit of friction and contradiction there um but yeah for me the, the, the like especially this kind of thing <laughs> is uh like a piece of arsenal that now sits on the mantle it's the best place for it but you're saying that like for example um, i ride my horse every day with spurs and then the extra long ones because the small ones don't work anymore you're saying that even i if I have the right mindset and the right um, feeling with my horse, if I get to know him, that I can still start riding without spurs and that my horse isn't dulled already? Well, it's a little bit, I, to view it very simply, it would be, I can make two examples. It's like if you were to work with someone in building a path and you're putting bricks down. And what happens to, have to happen first is you have to take away the old ground, you have to put sand down with a wheelbarrow and a shovel, you have to level the ground and you have to put the bricks down. If you're working with someone and every day you come and you go, okay, now it's time to pick up the shovel and dig the ground and you hit him with the stick, then the mindset of you coming and saying, come on, now you have to pick up the wheelbarrow. Now it's time to put the sand down. Now it's time to get the bricks. And it shouldn't go in the order of first that you poke <laughs> or take the shovel and take his hands and say, come on, this is what we have to do. You know, there's a progression in partnership and working. And actually, maybe politely in the beginning, you give an indication you think he doesn't understand <laughs> and you try to verbally say, oh, we have to put the sand like this and you see, oh, he still doesn't know what he's doing. So you give an example. You may even put his hand on the wooden screed stick and your hands and you show him and he says, oh, this is what we have to do. And then it gets reduced to you give the sign, he doesn't see it, and you say, hey, we have to do this. And he's like, oh, yeah. And he needs the verbal. And then as you go along, he's still an apprentice, so you come along and you just, it's time for the bricks, and you just look at the bricks. You don't need to say anything now, but you look, and he's like, ah, yeah, bricks is next. Oh, I know, I know a little bit what I'm doing now. I feel like I have knowledge and I know how to manage myself in this task, in this job we're doing. In the end, when working long enough, it's a sensation. You haven't headed towards the bricks you haven't headed towards the wheelbarrow you just have a sensation in your body that that's the next things to do and he has it also and you find yourself being there together 
doing the same task without talking, without nothing needs to be said anymore, nothing needs to be pointed at. You're just there in the conversation getting the job done. I used to make an example a while back about um, kids. You know, that it's, uh, there also needs to be that reward and that feeling of self-development, self-improvement, self-generated learning abilities, feeling like you are actually part of this conversation yourself. And I used to make the example of if you're the father that comes in and says, right, go in and clean your room now or I'm going to flog you with a big stick, you know that that's coming. So your mindset is a bit like, <sighs> fucking pricks getting me to do this again, walk in and you sort of kick the toys around, you do half a job, you're not really that motivated to go back to him and say, look what I've done. You just sort of go somewhere else and maybe sit on the couch and not want to talk to him at all. But if he came in and said, hey, look, we have to do this and this, and uh, if you do that, then I'll take you and kick the footy and we'll have McDonald's. He's like, well, he's a super guy. I'm going to run in there and do the best job I can and then be the quickest to come out and say, hey, hey, look, look what I've done. You know, knowing you get a reward, not going into the thing of it being a bribe, but knowing you're going to be rewarded for your efforts. And the more you try and the more you participate and the more you willingly want to get something out of this situation, then the dynamic, the feeling, the sensation, the experience of life is completely different. So, yeah, I think that that for me is also the basis uh, with the horses. And, you know, when you continue to poke someone with a stick, a minute you walk away, you know, you flog the guy that has to clean the stable every day. As soon as you leave, he's like, thank God he's gone. And each day you come, you need a bigger stick. You know, that little spur doesn't work anymore and you need the bigger one. And, you know, of course it's part of the physiology, it's part of the body that starts to think, okay, discomfort, shut, shut off to that because, you know, it's obviously there constantly and I'm not finding where I can relieve that. It comes every day and then you get a bigger one and, you know, for the really, really lazy horses that don't, you know, become sensitive, afraid enough, um, you know, or conditioned to it. The really lazy ones in the end, you, you know, you need to electrify them or something. <laughs> you know, if you have, don't have the horse with that quite the talent for jumping or dressers or whatever it is, you know, and you're, you're getting it from pressure, there's a point where the pressure is not going to ever be enough. But if you can build someone's motivation and will and want to do it more than you, he will perform out of his level of ability. And you don't need a fresh start for that. No, the fresh start is the change of mindset. The beginning, change the conversation. You know from one day to the next, if you're working with a guy and you stop poking him and you say, look, we're going to go about this differently. As soon as you say those words, he's like, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> Anything's better than the way we were doing it. <laughs> or a change is, you know, <laughs> as good as a holiday. <laughs> and Morton always used to, you know, this was also a quote that, really stuck with me from Morton in the beginning. Morton said to me, you can only ever force 50% out of them. If they want to do it, they can give you a hundred or more. And that, that's, you know, that was 22 years ago. <laughs> but it was only, you know, it's the natural journey and progression. I'm only to that point now where I'm getting to a stage where I really think about these things. And of course, I don't know, whether you get older and you've thought about enough of the wrong things, you start to think you're thinking about the right things. <laughs> you definitely start to try to make life easier on yourself, that's yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. <laughs>